Welcome back to our lecture series, Linear Algebra Done Openly. As usual, I'll be your professor today, Dr. Andrew Misseldine. Uh, this is our first video for section 3.5 entitled Matrix Factorizations. And this is going to be a continuation of the elementary factorizations we had presented in the previous section. Now, why do we care so much about how to factor matrices? In algebra, it's often important to be able to undo the process of multiplication. That is, you know, factorization. We see this in arithmetic all the time. Uh, so like if you give me the number 6, you might want to factor it as 2 times 3. There's information we gain by thinking of the factorization, this integer. We do the same thing with polynomials. If you take, for example, the polynomial x squared minus 1, this factors as x minus 1 and x plus 1. And we might use this factorization to help us solve the equation, or it tells us something about the polynomial when we can factor it. Factorization can be extremely useful in solving problems uh, that arise with such objects, like with, for example, with the equation x squared minus 1 equals 0. By the zero product property, we could infer that either x equals 1 equals 0, which would imply that x equals 1, or we see that x plus 1 equals 0, which would imply that x is equal to negative 1. We can gain information from this factorization and find the solution set to this system or to this uh to this this equation x squared minus one equals zero we can find out the solution sets negative one and one something like that um, such factorizations for matrices can be equally useful um, although no equivalent uh, idea of prime factorization or maybe irreducible factorization is going to exist for uh, matrices. The, the idea of unique factorization doesn't quite work the same way. There are still many, many, many useful factorizations for matrices, much like the elementary factorization we saw in the previous section. In this section, uh, we want to talk about generalizations of elementary matrices. And that's actually what the topic of this very video is about. Uh, the generalization of the elementary matrices or the elementary matrices 2.0 is going to actually lead very naturally to the LU factorization, which we'll see later on in this lecture. So when it came to the three elementary matrices, which came from the three elementary row operations, uh, there was three kinds. One of them was what we call a scaling elementary matrix, the scaling type. Uh, this had to do with when you multiply a row by a specific non-zero scalar, uh, that's equivalent to multiplying by the matrix for which you have ones along the diagonal, just like the identity matrix. Maybe you have some constant C um, somewhere in the middle, but you have ones everywhere else, and you have these zeros everywhere else. This idea of a scaling matrix. It looks like the identity matrix, but one of the ones along the diagonal was replaced with something else. Maybe a two, maybe a three. Now, we're also going to relax the condition a little bit in this section and allow that to scale by zero. Now, that's not properly an elementary matrix. Uh, because multiplying by zero is not an acceptable elementary row operation because it can't be undone. It's it's not invertible. Uh, we're going to allow it for this situation. We could scale a row by zero. Well, if we want to generalize this, why do we have to require only one non-unital value along the diagonals? What if we allow any of the numbers along the diagonals to potentially be any number we want? It could be one, it could be two, it could be the square root of pi, it could be zero, whatever. And this then leads to the idea of a diagonal matrix. A diagonal matrix will be a square matrix, say it's n by n, for which every number that's not on the main diagonal will be zero. In particular, we have these numbers along the, di the main diagonal. We'll call it D1, D2, D3, all, up, all the way up to Dn. So we're going to have n many numbers right here. But everyone else off of the diagonal, these are all going to be zeros. All of these numbers right here, these are all going to be zeros. And sometimes you see me draw a giant zero to represent that all of these numbers are going to be zeros. It's a very common notation when you, you see in linear algebra here. Now, that's not to say that the numbers on the diagonal are non-zero. Like I said, for a diagonal matrix, we do allow for uh, zeros along the diagonal. So an example of such a thing, we'll see some more just in a second. You know, we would, we would allow something like 1, 0, 2, and then zeros everywhere else. This is an example of a diagonal matrix. We allow these, uh, we allow any number along the diagonal we want. All right, just, just as an example of such a thing. Now, the identity matrix, 
is an example of a diagonal matrix. All of the di all the entries along the diagonal are just a one. Um, the zero matrix is also an example of a diagonal matrix. Like if we take the three by three zero matrix, this would be considered a diagonal matrix because the definition of a diagonal matrix means that everything off of the diagonal is zero and makes no stipulations on what is on the main diagonal. So the zero matrix would be an acceptable such an example acceptable example. In a diagonal matrix, uh, the diagonal the diagonal entries need not be the same. Um, they can be anything they want, and like the zero and identities. Those those are ones where the diagonal entries all the same. But we could get anything, like we saw the one zero uh, two matrix a moment ago, right? Sometimes people use the notation uh, something like diag, and then they'll have a list of numbers so like one zero two. And this is sometimes shorthand for oh, we're gonna have the diagonal matrix. We have one zero two along the diagonals and everywhere else. Because oh, to 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 Describe a diagonal matrix, we just need to know who are the diagonal entries. That's all there is to it. Um, in general, an n by n diagonal matrix D is of the form displayed right here. You can see, you can see here on the screen. And every diagonal matrix can then be factored as a product of elementary matrices of scaling type. This is again if we allow the idea of a zero scaling. So like if you take the matrix one, one, zero along the diagonal, zeros everywhere else, this would be a matrix for which you would scale the third row by zero. Again, that's not an elementary matrix, but if we allow that slight singular example of a scaling matrix to come out, uh, then every diagonal matrix can be factored uniquely. Uh, and I should say uniquely, because again, the unique factorization doesn't exactly exist, but we can factor every diagonal matrix as a product of these uh, scaling elementary matrices. And in fact, all as scaling elementary matrices can have at most one non-unitable non -unital diagonal entry, we can view diagonal matrices as their generalization, generalization. So these are scaling elementary matrices 2.0, right? We just kind of squish them all together. Now, similar to how scaling matrices multiply, we can see that if A is a matrix, so you have some matrix A, if you calculated D times A, what this is going to do is this is going to be the matrix where the ith, the ith row of A is in fact multiplied, it's multiplied by this factor DI. So you're going to multiply the ith row of A by DI. So diagonal matrices have the nice convenient fact that if you multiply on the left by a diagonal matrix, it'll just scale every row by that value. And if you go on the other side, if you take A times D, what's going to happen here is that the ith column, oh, I don't like using I to describe columns. Let's switch it up and call it J. That's our usual convention. AD here, the ith column of A here is going to be multiplied by this factor DJ. So multiplying a diagonal matrix on the left scales all the rows. Multiplying by a diagonal matrix on the right scales all the columns. That's what I'm trying to say right here. So in particular, a product of two diagonal matrices is also going to be a diagonal matrix uh, whose diagonal entries are simply going to be the products of the corresponding diagonal entries. So this is some important thing about diagonal matrices, that if you have two diagonal matrices of the same size, when you add them together, you're going to get a diagonal matrix again. If you scale a diagonal matrix, you're gonna get a, a diagonal matrix. So the, the span, the linear combinations of diagonal matrices will be diagonal. And so we could talk about the space, the space of diagonal matrices. Uh, space of diagonal matrices. This would be a subspace of F to the N by N. And in fact, this is going to be an N dimensional subspace. Because uh, basically you can choose freely any of the numbers along the diagonal. And now and that'll give you a basis for this, this space here. You take, you're going to take the first one, E11, then you take as a second basis elements, E22, and you continue all the way down to E N N. And that's that's what we meant by the basis of such a vector space. Now this this is sort of a curious object though that in addition to being closed under scalar multiplication and uh, addition of matrices, this is also closed under multiplication. That's what I meant by the product of diagonal matrices is in fact going to be a diagonal matrix.
Now, furthermore, if no diagonal entry is zero, a diagonal matrix it will be a product of elementary matrices, like I meant before, it's of the scaling type. And hence, by the non-singular matrix theorem, the sum, uh, it, it'll be non-singular, that's what I was trying to say, sorry. So that if there's no zeros along the diagonals, this thing will be non-singular, and therefore its inverse will be given by the following formula. You just take the reciprocals of each of the, uh, each of the diagonal entries, and that will then form the inverse matrix if you're non-singular. So we, a diagonal matrix will be non-singular if and only if it has non-zero entries along the diagonal. Let's look at some specific examples here. Uh, some of these we've already alluded to here. Take the matrix A, which is three by three, which is a diagonal matrix. It has a negative one half, one and three along its diagonal. Well, we can see very quickly that this matrix will be non-singular because the diagonal entries are not zero. You have negative one half, one and three. And so by taking reciprocals, the inverse of this matrix will be very easy to compute. You're just going to get negative two, the reciprocal of negative one half. You'll get one, the reciprocal of one, and then you'll get a one third instead of a three. Um, powers of this matrix are also pretty easy because when you multiply diagonal matrices together, you just multiply together the diagonal entries. So a to the fourth just means you're going to take negative one half to the fourth, which is one sixteenth. You're going to take one to the fourth, which is just one, and you're gonna take three to the fourth, which is just a to one. A to the negative fourth is just as easy. You just take the reciprocals of all these numbers here. So you get 16, one and one over 81. Let's consider a factorization of this thing here, that our matrix A, because you have these two non-unital values, that is these non, these values that are not one, anything that's on the diagonal to one, I don't have to worry about the factorization here. But because you have this, uh, these non-unital values along the diagonal, you can factor A into a product of elementary matrices using that. We're gonna get an elementary matrix which is associated to scaling the first row by negative one half, and we're gonna get an elementary matrix associated to scaling the third row by three in which case you do something like this. And if you scale by zero, you're gonna throw in um, a matrix with such a zero along the diagonal somewhere along the way. And then also, just as a quick example here, if we take this matrix A and we multiply it by say the matrix one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eight, eight, nine, we can very quickly do this product here because multiplying on the left by A, you're gonna scale the first row by negative one half. So you get negative one half, negative one, and negative three halves. You're gonna scale the second row by one, which does nothing. And you're gonna scale the third row by three, which gives us 21, 24, and 27. That would be the matrix product there. If we did it the other way around, if we take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and multiply by our diagonal matrix A in this situation. We're gonna scale each of the rows and such by these values. So the first row gets scaled by negative one half. So you get negative one half, negative two, and negative seven halves. The second column, excuse me, you're gonna times by one, so two, five, and eight. And then you're gonna scale the third row by three, uh, which is gonna give us nine, 18, and 27 again. And so we can see that these things are not true in general. Or they're not, I should say, they're not equal. Matrices don't typically commute. But uh, the diagonal matrix is pretty easy to do multiplication by. You just scale, uh, you scale rows if you multiply on the left, and you scale columns if you multiply on the right. Now I mentioned that matrix multiplication is in general non-commutative. There is a special family of diagonal matrices for which matrix multiplication is gonna be commutative, and these are called scalar matrices, not to be confused with the scalene elementary matrices we were talking about. A scalar matrix is a matrix which is a, um, which just has the same diagonal entry, right? So it's a diagonal matrix, but you have the exact same number along the diagonal with no exceptions to that. Uh, be aware that if you have such a scalar matrix, this will just look like C times the identity matrix because you could factor the C away. And so a scalar, a scalar matrix is really just um, a scalar multiple of the identity matrix. Uh, let's call this C for a moment, capital C. And if you have any matrix times, times that by A, what happens here is that, well, capital C is just the same thing as lower C times the identity. And by associativity here, we'll get the identity times A, which is just A. And so multiplying by a scalar matrix 
is the same thing as multiplying by a scalar itself. And that's why we actually call these things scalar matrices, that multiplying by a scalar matrix is just the same thing as scalar multiplication. We can, we can think of matrix multiplication as a generalization of scalar multiplication, at least in the context of matrices. And I wanna mention here that since CA uh, is the same thing, this is gonna be the same thing as A times CI, right? This is a property of matrix multiplication. This is gonna equal AC. Scalar matrices are exactly those matrices that commute with all matrices whatsoever in terms of matrix multiplication. That's not true for diagonal matrices in general but scalar matrices do in fact commute with everything. And so this is our first elementary row, uh, elementary matrix 2.0. The, ele the, the, the scaling elementary matrices can upgrade to this general family of diagonal matrices.